now. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Bronfen from the University of Zurich, where I teach in the English department, but um, also do a lot of work on visual culture and gender studies. And um, I am in conversation today with um, Griselda Pollack from the University of Leeds. We've been having conversations about issues around feminism, women and art, women in art, psychoanalysis uh, for many years now. And we want to um, engage in this conversation with each other for you in, in the context of this series on long duration. Hello, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm delighted to be in conversation with one of the extraordinary thinkers of our time in terms of all these issues and certainly about recurrence and persistence, which I think is an underlying theme. And the other underlying theme I think we share is the ways in which art and culture deals with issues of persistence and recurrence in terms of crisis and particularly in terms of trauma of different kinds. So Elizabeth, the first sort of question I'd like to put to you today is the way in which this has become a, a very deep theme across the huge range of your work. Could you talk about some of these, the areas through which you've tracked this in terms of the different kinds of books that you're dealing with? And then perhaps bring us to the understanding of why you've turned to or work with someone like Abi Warburg and his concept of Nachleben as or afterlife or persistence as we translate it into English. Um, well, my very first work was on um, representations of death and more specifically feminine death. So one of the things that I've always been interested in um, are both in literary and in visual um, contexts, those moments where what one is trying to describe or what one feels compelled to describe falls outside of language or outside of images. And death is, of course, one of those moments. We know that death will happen. We can see someone who has died, but the experience of death is something that we cannot communicate to anyone else. Yet there's an endless amount of texts and um, paintings that try to engage with this problem of death. Um, and this, similar to this idea that once we then have representations of death, they are clearly formalized. Um, I have always been interested in this um, contradiction of something which deals with strong affects, intensities, energies, and the fact that the only way that we can transmit them is by virtue of formalization. Um, this was then also true when I looked at hysteria and I became interested in hysteria as a form of articulation in relationship to trauma. This was true when I was looking at war films and how we remember and are also haunted by past wars and thus need for example, war films, but one could make a similar case for war photography or war literature in order to deal with something, but we're always doing it after. And that's why I think the importance of persistence means two things. Something is not finished yet, this import, important point of unfinished business in a culture. So that's why it persists, um, but it also becomes relevant again at certain historical moments. And that's where for me, Valbrook is so important because when he speaks about pathos formula, it's important to bear in mind that the very first pathos formula is already a formalization of an affect, of an emotion, of an intensity. So what persists, what has an afterlife and what resurfaces is not the affect as such, but the way in which it has already been contained in an aesthetic form. And here, I think the word contained is important because of course in English, contained means two things. It means that you fenced something in, but also that something is being preserved in the container. So th this is kind of the connection, the overall connection that I see with um, the various different uh, themes that I have then looked at in relationship to what keeps haunting us, what we have to keep addressing, what persists in a certain, as you'd also said, recurrence. So there's always a seriality um, at play, um, but also that this is important at certain moments. There's certain moments when something resurfaces. And that too is something I take from Warburg because um, in your reading of Warburg, and um, I can then in, in, in fact ask you back, you emphasize that the re re recurrence of certain 
pathos gestures happens at moments of crises. So wh why, why is it important? Why is the concept of crises so important, both for your work and also for mine, obviously? Um, let me take that through the question because of what you've just said in terms of trauma. So in the work that I've done, particularly that was animated by Warburg, I, I had kind of two, two ways into that one. One is the question of trauma. And I identified trauma in four ways. One is that it's um, overwhelmingly present because it never gets digested and transformed. Secondly, it's absolutely absent. So it's got no formulation. It just is this, as you say, haunting, un unmanageable, unassimilable, but it sort of presses a perpetual affect with an enormous amount of kind of um, uncontained energy, you know, anxiety. And therefore it's, it's also belated. So it never happens for itself, but happens subsequently when a later event inherits this undigested, unharvested and contained freight of anxiety and charges it up with a secondary force, which in a sense becomes the first time that the trauma actually finds a, a form. And then of course it's transmissible so I was very interested in how you put something that is inherently unrepresentable and only at the level of effect into this. So we share this Warburg sense that he um, reaches back and sense the origins of art in ritual with Jane Harrison and the, the people who came, who inspired Warburg, that art is, you know, was always was per, a performative ex exorcism of the anxiety of living and the vulnerability and fragility of life. So when it, acquires these forms, these images become kind of um, charged batteries, sort of mnemonic batteries, which cultures reach back and recharge their and animate their culture with that. So how did that happen in the 20th century? So I was interested in what would it be not to do look at the re revival of classical and pagan art in the Renaissance, but to say catastrophically the 20th century and the traumas of the 20th century destroyed in a sense the language of art. And yet some aspects persist, but they are transformed. So I was interested in my book on this idea of after affects, but then also what are these after images, which combine what I think you're saying as well, this sense of a, an affective charge that defies our comprehension and our articulation. And yet art is a kind of bridging space. But I think 20th century artists had to invent new pathos formulae. And therefore they're not just abstract and they're not just got away figuration, there's something. But the other thing I found in my writing, which, re which perplexed me, which was they were, artists were not discharging their anxiety by formulating. They transform it to form and formulate it. But I, I came to the conclusion that they were traveling throughout their lives away from this unknown, as it were, psychic, dimension or irritant, and that they were not trying to get away from the trauma, but their actual art was a journey towards an encounter. Mm. And they had to build a kind of aesthetic formulation through the kind of practices that modern artists do, which are inventive, even they're not kind of continuations, they're not referencing, they, they are continuously inventing forms. They, they only encounter it when there is a form that can in sense, in, uh, not contain, but in sense, transform. And in the words of Bracha Ettinger, transport create a kind of transport station where it's possible. And this can be catastrophic. So coming back to crisis, what you said, which is in some of the artists that I studied, the, the encounter ultimately destroyed the capacity to continue. And then others, they found a psychic, a kind of an aesthetic economy and a psychic economy, which would enable a continuation of their practice. Uh, but it is always a long journey. And that's how you then you retrospectively track the art, you know, you see that it's not, you know, the, the work is always a kind of recurrence, but each time a different kind of take on that. And I, I wonder if that brings us to me, to go back to, to, to your work in, in a particular way. Um, in particular sense of the, the, the writings that you have in the book behind you on cross mappings, because you have also taken up this, uh, kind of a Warburgian model of a very um, multi-leveled and transdisciplinary intersection that 
of, of words and images and thoughts and ideas into your studies of contemporary art. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about cross mappings. What kind of concept is that and how did you practice that? I think it really picks up nicely with what you've just said in relationship to the trans formation um, and the transport, that is to say transformation as formations that, that, that as, uh, with trans as the word that move between various areas. Um, and what I was interested in um, precisely because of this notion of recurrence over a long period of time, um, looking at previous texts and then subsequent texts. To be completely precise here now, looking for example, at um, certain ways that a Shakespeare play will formulate anxieties regarding um, female sovereignty or uh, the, the, the repetition compulsion at the heart of war. And then looking at other texts, not adaptations of Shakespeare plays, that I wasn't so interested in, but pl other places, then let's say what Shakespeare's theater was to the early modern stage in London, opera is to the um, cosmopolitan world in the 19th and cinema is to a uh, globalized world in the 20th. And then with always looking for one piece that really was analogous, otherwise it doesn't work, otherwise it becomes too eclectic for my days, saying something keeps returning over a long period of time. And when it returns, it moves not just from one historical period and one historical um, situation to the next, um, but in what I was particularly interested in is the shift in media from, for example, Shakespeare plays to, let's say, film or contemporary um, um, television drama. And I was interested in both seeing the similarities, that is to say, why do certain things recur again and again and again, but obviously also the differences. So my point here, because you use the word encounter, um, I, I take from the um, American um, philosopher Stanley Cavell, the notion of conversation. And of course, we are the ones who are producing this conversation, we critics or the artists to a certain degree, who are the subsequent artists who are producing the con a conversation. <clears throat> but as a critic, I'm not even so interested whether it is an explicit conversation as to say, and now comes the last bit that is imp important for me with the cross mapping. It's not just looking at how earlier historical texts keep returning in different formations and asking why these changes in formations, but also looking backwards. So to pick up on another concept that a mutual friend of ours, Mika Bal, has proposed, namely that of preposterous history, looking at the past through the recyclings that something has had. And um, so that it's a conversation, not just be from the past into the present, but also from the present into the past, allowing us both to see something new in the prior text, but also something new in the subsequent text. And, um, and so the, cross, the notion of cross mapping, which for me was always also connected with the questions of gendering, because much of the artwork that I've been reading as a critic is either work by women or explicitly feminist or not, but also in the arena of um, male uh, artists impersonating the feminine, cross-dressing either literally like Touchant or in some way or another, trying to get into the feminine as one might say in the um, Degas paintings of women, the portraits that Degas made of women, which is what the first text in that book, um, Cross Mapping. So, um, it's, um, it's the idea that you're mapping something and then you're mapping something else and then you layer these different maps on top of each other in order to find indeed a kind of aesthetic long durée and asking yourself why the persistence of these themes in these forms of formulations. Indeed, one might even speak about a kind of aesthetic sustainability. Something doesn't die off, something continues for a certain reason and not necessarily <clears throat> by intent, but rather by some non-subjective force. Mm 